Hello everyone and welcome to Archaeology in the Digital Age. My name is Caroline Arbuckle McLeod and for today's post I thought I'd do something a little bit different and share with you a presentation I did at a conference at the University of British Columbia. Now my usual research is about the construction of ancient Egyptian coffins, archaeological wood identification, and the woodworking workshops in the ancient Mediterranean. So why am I talking to you about video games? Well, I really like video games, and in 2017, I was invited to test the Assassin's Creed Origins game. I was really impressed by the game's portrayal of ancient Egypt, and decided to see how accurate the reconstructions presented by this game were and how it might be used for teaching, which got me thinking about the potential of video games for archaeology in general. Now, looking into this, what I found was a really fascinating subdiscipline of archaeology called archaeogaming which I'd like to talk to you a bit about before returning to Assassin's Creed Origins and explaining why I think this is an excellent tool for studying, teaching, and popularizing Egyptian archaeology, and why we should be more willing to consider video games as a serious resource, rather than just frivolous entertainment. So first off, what is archaeogaming? The term was coined in 2013 by Andrew Reinhardt, who defined archaeogaming as the archaeology in and of digital games. It refers to the development of a small and very recent subfield of archaeology and includes scholars such as Tara Copplestone, Andrew Reinhardt, and a group of scholars called VALUE, which stands for Video Games and Archaeology at Leiden University, where significant work on this subject is being carried out. Archaeogaming is a term that covers a few different approaches. Sticking to the archaeology of video games, work has been done on the physical video game, as in the cartridges and the discs, and their significance as archaeological artifacts. So, for instance, Atari, a rather early video game console and brand, for those of you not old enough to know them, they had a series of rather unpopular video games, perhaps the worst offender being E.T. the Game, commonly acknowledged as the worst video game of all time. They decided to bury the unsold video games in what is referred to as the Atari Burial Ground in New Mexico. The story of the excavation is part of a documentary called Atari Game Over, and is described in Reinhardt's book, Archaeogaming. The next approach to the archaeology of video games considers the built environment in which the game is played. This involves both the history and structure of the game design through how, to how players interact and how objects circulate during gameplay. This is particularly useful in open world games. These are non-linear games where you're free to move around the world and interact with all buildings and elements such as Skyrim, Red Dead Redemption, or Assassin's Creed, as opposed to linear games with very specific interactive elements, as seen in Super Mario World, for instance. Now, one project that I found very interesting in this regard is by Angus Moll, who studied the movements of objects collected, gifted, stolen, and disposed of in a game in order to create a model for socio-material networks that could help to think about the creation of the material record. Archaeology in video games refers to games that represent the people and cultures we study, or the practice of archaeology itself, and it's this aspect of archaeogaming that I'll be talking about today. Many of these archaeologically themed games are designed purely for entertainment. In this Tomb Raider game, Lara Croft and the Temple of Osiris, the god Amit destroys temples and chases down Lara Croft, which is not, as far as I'm aware, historically accurate, and does not communicate much about Egyptian culture. Other games are more serious about their intent to educate and inform. The game Never Alone, for instance, has significant cultural value. The game was created by the Cook Inlet Tribal Council, or CITC, in order to promote awareness of the indigenous culture in Yupiak in Alaska. The theatrical elements of the game are drawn in the traditional form of illustration, and the voiceover remains in the original Inupiaq language. Let's take a look. Unipkaq te aksiikpin. Tala ni rakan nasu unipkaq te aksiikpin. Nive aksiikpin aksiikpin inyuniak niksuk angayukagamini. Sumitemma. The game is based on one of their oral stories about a little girl named Nuna and her fox friend who seek to find the source of an eternal blizzard. In the game, the player takes on the role of Nuna or the fox and completes different quests to reach their goal. 
At different points, buttons appear on the screen that allow the player to read more about the history and culture of the Inupiaq people. The game turned out to be more successful than the Cook Inlet Tribal Council could have imagined. This game won a number of very prestigious awards and has proven to be very popular, encouraging Eline Media, the game producers, to launch a new line of the game called World Games. The educational value of Assassin's Creed games are somewhere in the middle. They have larger-than-life fictional storylines set among real-world historical events, and are world-renowned for the realism of their graphics and the effort that the game designers have put into recreating the historical monuments within their open world. The Ubisoft team to the took the educational aspects one step further in Assassin's Creed Origins. Assassin's Creed Origins takes place in Ptolemaic Egypt, where a Medje, a type of ancient policeman, named Bayek, must fight against religious and political conspiracies occurring in the background of the more widely known historical events surrounding Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, and Augustus. The character battles larger-than-life priests and politicians, as well as giant snakes and monstrous versions of the god Anubis in a dreamlike parallel realm. The main story is therefore exciting and dramatic and almost entirely fictional. While many of the historical sites seem to be relatively accurate, additional elements have been added to assist the gameplay. By following the main storyline, you may have a better idea of the geography of Egypt, its flora, fauna, and architectural styles, but you won't have gained significant insight into Egyptian history or beliefs. But Ubisoft added in an update in 2018, the Discovery Tour, which drastically altered the historical and archaeological value of the game. The discovery tours the open world created for the game, with all the violence and storyline removed, allowing players to walk around without being attacked. In addition to being able to explore the digital world, Ubisoft worked with a number of Egyptologists to create short walkthrough lessons that explain details about a number of archaeological sites, historical events, and Egyptian beliefs and practices. In these lessons, they also point out historical inaccuracies in the game, which is, I think, really important. The lesson on temples, for instance, points out that while you can enter the temple sanctuaries as a player in the main storyline, in ancient Egypt, only very high-ranking priests would have been able to do so. By adding in this element to the game, players who might have been curious about what was accurate have a chance to begin to learn the true histories, which will hopefully prompt them to explore details further on their own. This snapshot shows just a selection of the types of lessons you can follow in Assassin's Creed Origins. These take the form of two to seven minute walkthrough lessons. I've reviewed a number of these lessons and they're actually really good. Just to give an idea of what these tours are like, I've included this clip. The Giza Plateau is located on the west bank of the Nile and was considered by ancient Egyptians as the domain of the dead. The pyramidal complexes found there were built over the span of three generations during the reign of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkara. So in these lessons, you can move through the game as usual and follow this golden trail to select information points. A voiceover tells you about where you are and additional plans or images of artifacts appear in the left-hand corner of the screen. Players can choose to learn more about these cultural details by clipping, clicking on these images. So the lessons are great, and they discuss the inaccuracies of both the storyline and some of the reconstructions, but not all of them. So what about those monuments that aren't discussed in these voiceovers? Has Ubisoft created a world of accurate, interactive 3D models that can be used for teaching? Well, yes and no. I was interested in getting a better idea about the accuracy of the reconstructions that weren't covered in the tours, and decided to investigate the Pyramid of Khafre. Before we go on to the comparative model, I just want to walk you through this image so you can follow along a bit more easily. The path we're going to take starts at the upper passage, entered at the, at the side of the pyramid. Then we'll go down that passage and across the main burial chamber. We'll turn around, go down the descending passage, and then up the second ascending passage, back down, before ending in the subsidiary chamber. You'll understand my choice of this rather circuitous route in a moment. And this too on the right-hand side of the screen is an image of what the burial chamber looks like today. So to appreciate the accuracy of the pyramid, I decided to compare the reconstruction of the interior of Khafre's pyramid by Assassin's Creed, which is on the left there, 
and by Harvard University's ongoing project, Digital Giza, which is seen on the right and is freely available on their website. In the corner of the Giza screen is also a map that shows you where you are in a 2D plan, but it's a little small, which is why I put up the plan on the previous slide. So let's start. The music you're hearing is from the Assassin's Creed game. There's no music associated with Harvard's plan. So going down now, the descending passage. We're going to drop down just a little bit. And come back up to head to the burial chamber. Now the game does take some liberties. You'll notice that the passageways have been shortened, for instance, and the game is also set at a much later period than Digital Giza is meant to convey. So the game designers have added in elements of decay and neglect. In general, however, the interior structure presented in the game is pretty accurate. You take the first ascending passage through to the upper burial chamber. We look at the sunken sarcophagus, like we saw in the photo of Kafre's burial chamber, though in the Giza model, for some reason, it hasn't been sunk. Maybe it's about to be sunk. Just the time period. So we'll come back through that passage. Down the descending passage. To the lower level. You can see both versions have this little side chamber here. And then in the game, the ascending passage from the lower level remains blocked off by sand, as it would have been after Kafre's burial. But you can enter this game, or this area, in the digital Giza model, however. So we're back up here. This is the outside of the pyramid again. That's where we started. And we'll go back in and rejoin our avatar. And now we're in the second lower chamber. And that's also portrayed in a pretty similar manner in both instances. Up until here, the Assassin's Creed reconstruction is therefore more or less accurate. Then it takes some additional liberties. During gameplay, the player finds a secret passage off of the lower burial chamber and finds him or herself in an additional secret underground temple with riches and a final sarcophagus. Now, as far as I know, this does not exist in real life and is purely added for entertainment in the gameplay. Okay. So, despite the additions, I still think Assassin's Creed Origins has great potential for teaching. One nice thing that they've done is to add these extra details in a way that we could ignore them if we so wished, which means that we can use the majority of the reconstructed monuments to create our own 3D tours of the features and the buildings we're teaching about. And the game makes sharing these videos very easy. There's a share button right on the controller, if you're playing a PS4, which you can click and select footage of your gameplay, and then send it to YouTube or your Facebook page, where you can download it and put it into presentations, which is what I've done for this presentation. Or of course, you can just play the game directly with the class. And by the way, the Discovery Tour can be bought separately from the entire game for $19.99, and no, I don't get a cut from Ubisoft. And actually, the fact that the reconstructions aren't perfect has unintended value for those of us teaching advanced students. This makes it possible for us to assign students different monuments and then have them compare the reconstruction with the excavation reports and diagrams. This will force them to look more carefully at the model and decide whether inconsistencies are due to inaccuracies or due to the late time period in which the game is set. There are a number of other elements in the game reconstruction that may give them a bit of a leg up over the more technically accurate digital Giza model. The open world elements, along with the sophisticated changes in light and sound, will allow students to get a better idea of the geographic and contextual location of these features, and also contribute to a better understanding 
of the sensory experience of moving through these enclosed dark spaces. After teaching about Assassin's Creed and showing this model in a class, I gave out an optional and anonymous survey to the students. 31 of them responded, and all of them, unsurprisingly, agreed that they would like to see video games used in teaching. Some of the more popular comments were that, while both models were great for visualizing monuments, the Assassin's Creed game was better for communicating the whole experience. A number said that they liked the game, uh, they liked that the game could be critiqued, and so could inspire discussion. Some of them also specifically said that they and many of their peers were particularly visual learners and would appreciate this type of interactive element in the classroom. A couple, however, did also bring up some concerns about game-related projects, including that they thought it would be too much work, which is somewhat questionable, and would ruin the fun of the game. Another noted that they think it would be really fun, but only if there was scheduled lab time so they wouldn't have to buy the game themselves, and I think that these are things that we do have to consider. Then, just my favorite comment, was that video games for education are excellent because they even trick you into learning. So in general, I am sold about the ability of games, particularly Assassin's Creed games, to work as a teaching tool, but that's not all that Ubisoft is contributing to Egyptology. While working on the game with Egyptologists, the digital experts became so enamored with ancient Egypt that they wanted to contribute something to the academic research world as well. To this end, they are currently working on the Hieroglyphs Initiative, a crowdsourced effort that aims to train and use machine learning to basically create an automatic digital translator for hieroglyphs. Now, hopefully this will become an app that you literally just hold over the hieroglyphs and it translates them automatically into English. Now, of course, this is still a work in progress, and if anybody wants to take part, you can sign up and help out too. Having expressed my clear admiration of the game as a teaching tool, let's not forget what it's doing for popularizing Egyptian history and archaeology. In its first week of sales, Assassin's Creed Origins sold over 1.5 million copies, and the Discovery Tour is freely available to all of these individuals. Now, whether or not they will use it is a different question, but judging by the number of blogs and discussions dedicated to uncovering the historical accuracy of all the Assassin's Creed games, a high proportion of them certainly are. I should also point out that Many of my students in the past are Assassin's Creed fans, so it's important to note that they are being exposed to the game anyway. We might as well help them understand which aspects are a true representation of the past and which are just fantasy. To conclude this presentation, I just want to remind you all that Egyptologists aren't the only scholars who can benefit from these relatively cheap and available resources. Assassin's Creed games cover a whole range of time periods and locations. And for the classical archaeologists, the most recent release is Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is set during the Peloponnesian War, and includes monuments from Athens, Olympia, Naxos, Lesbos, and more. And they just announced they'll be adding a discovery tour for that game as well, which is something I think we can all look forward to. I should note, though, that you really should discuss these games with your students, and in particular the way that different peoples are represented so thank you for listening and for considering video games as another resource for visualizing and communicating about the past. And just as a final note, if you want to learn more about video games and archaeology, including the scholarly research projects associated with it, I've put the links down beneath this video as well. Thanks very much and hope to see you again soon.